Hey, beautiful friends. Boy, do we have a good topic for you today. We are going to talk all about YouTube and the type of content you should be creating on YouTube. But before we dive in, I want to emphasize a couple of things. I talk a lot on the show about avoiding social media if you don't want to be on social media, if you find that it's taking you down that comparison trap, imposter syndrome, doubt, fear, all of those things. And one of the sustainable marketing strategies that I think is absolutely fabulous. And I am just now starting to dabble in it. I'm late to the game, of course, and I kind of regret that, but it's YouTube. And here's the thing. You can create a video for social media and it may last six hours on Facebook. It may last 48 hours on Instagram. You create content for YouTube and it's going to last at least 20 days. So you have a lifetime of opportunity on YouTube to be able to be found by those clients that are ready to buy from you. You can warm your clients faster um, through video. We know that. So this is a great opportunity for you to learn some content creation strategies that are more evergreen. And of course, you could repurpose them somewhere else. But YouTube is also a great form, <clears throat> excuse me, a form of SEO. And of course, we're all about SEO here on the show. So with out further ado, I'm going to bring on Trina Little. Trina. Welcome to the Robin Graham show. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Oh, I'm so excited to have you because I think this is such a hot topic right now. And you are the only true YouTube expert that I've met that I know. So <laughs> I'm honored to have you here to join us and to tell us more about YouTube and how we can start strategizing or incorporating that into our brand marketing strategy. So with that said, will you tell the listeners a little bit about you and what brought you to this journey, to this part of your journey and to focus solely on YouTube? Yeah. And I will say, um, when you look at YouTube experts, there are a lot of great experts out there. I've worked with them. I've built programs for some of them on the back end. But what I focus on is YouTube strategy for business owners. And it's a very different strategy than what I don't want to call them YouTube gurus, but a lot of the YouTube experts out there are speaking to those that want to become quote unquote YouTubers. And that's never what I wanted to do. So I started out um, right before I had my daughter, I was dabbling with, you know, what I wanted to do. I hated the job that I had. And um, while, while I was pregnant, I found YouTube was figuring out like, is this normal for pregnancy? What to expect? What to buy? And since I have a master's degree in marketing, my marketing brain clicked with these videos. And I was like, wow, what? these videos, these, they weren't called influencers at the time in 2014. It's like these influencers are convincing me what I need to buy. And this is really solid marketing. Um, and so I started trying to figure it out, dabbling. I thought I was going to be a YouTube influencer at the time. They were mommy vloggers. And I quickly realized I am not somebody to vlog my life or take a camera to Target, which I did try once, felt incredibly awkward. But I saw <laughs> the power that YouTube and marketing had together. And I just started learning. I just started figuring things out. I, I would play on the, my vlog channel and then I would play on the business channel and share what I experienced or what I learned from there. And it just kind of snowballed from there within... Uh, you know, two months of starting my YouTube channel, I had people pinging me in Facebook groups like this is the YouTube girl at the time. Uh, I hadn't really done much, but this was the YouTube girl. I had got a client who had wanted me to manage her entire YouTube channel, again, without doing any kind of marketing, but YouTube videos. And I just continued to stick with YouTube it kept me going through baby number two and postpartum depression and COVID. Uh, the only thing that I focused on to grow my business was a weekly YouTube video. And it just constantly showed me the power that YouTube had because my audience grew, my Instagram, not my Instagram, my email list grew with every single video that I created. And so that's kind of the journey that I had. I just wanted out of the job that I hated. And it just kind of evolved into this YouTube strategy business. Mm, I love it. And I love that it's YouTube strategy um, because I think strategy is so incredibly important. We can't really achieve goals or grow our businesses without strategy and then action. And alongside that, a positive mindset. And I, I want to circle back 
um, hopefully we have time later to your postpartum depression and mental health, because mm -hmm. I know you have a passion about mental health and why YouTube can be beneficial for using it as a tool to grow your business instead of like social media platforms because of the mental health component that can so often drag people down. So we'll circle back to that. <laughs> um, but before we do that, I want to get into the meat of the episode and that is um, the type of content. And I love how you emphasize that there are YouTubers, but then there is this component of YouTube for business owners. And I would love for you to differentiate that for us, mm -hmm. like explain to us what type of content as business owners, entrepreneurs, what should we be putting on YouTube? Yeah. So I worked on the back end of a YouTube educators uh, business for a while and managed quite a few of his channels. And he basically serviced or worked with YouTubers, people who were making money from YouTube AdSense. The goal was more views, more subscribers, bigger, bigger, bigger. And I found it very odd when I was digging into their things and looking at strategy, how their only source of income was YouTube AdSense. And I thought, huh, that's odd because you don't have control over that. YouTube is obviously taking a cut of AdSense. If, you know, something were to change on the platform, and which did in 2018, don't quote me on the on the year, but there was a big shift on YouTube when it came to targeting children. And so a lot of the channels that I worked with were kids channels, and they basically had their AdSense revenue ripped out from under them because they were no longer to, able to generate revenue if they were targeting children. And so I just thought it was so strange. These channels with tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of uh, subscribers I was still making more money than them with a channel, not even a quarter of the size, because the goal of my channel were to attract a niche, very niche audience that would then want to work with me. And so that's where this realization came that as a business owner, we aren't trying to reach the masses. We are trying to reach the people right before they need your solution. So they are probably problem aware because they're typing their problem into YouTube and they're trying to figure out that solution. And if you can find them right at that point, that's the kind of content and that's the kind of viewers you want that are going to then convert into a webinar, a work with me page, uh, your email list, whatever you want to send them to. But we're not about getting the masses because we obviously don't want to rely on YouTube AdSense. We want to keep as much money for ourselves as possible and getting them in our business is how we can do that. Mm -hmm. I love that. So when we talk about type of content, we're not, we're not creating content in a way that's going to be, I mean, I guess it could be fun and fluffy, depending on what our business is. And if we are an influencer and we're wanting to grow an influencer type business. However, if you are an entrepreneur, say, let's just use, because I work with a lot of health coaches, let's just use health coaches as the example for um, our conversation today. So say you're a health coach, what type of content shall we, should we put on the platform that is going to let those people know, here mm -hmm. we are, we're here to help you. We're here to provide the solution that you're looking for. This is great. So I will say there's a ratio of content that you want to create, obviously educational content or what I call discoverable content, how people are going to discover you is going to be probably 70% of your content, but then you want to create community content, content that allows people to get to know you, get to like you, because if you are a coach, it's a very intimate relationship and they need to like you to want to buy from you. And so there is a ratio of content that you do need to create that's educational authority building, trust building, but also that connection piece as well. So in the example of a health coach, you're not going to want to jump out the gate on YouTube creating a video on how to lose weight. That is very broad. Um, I, in my workshop, Profit Per View, I talk about the viewer, uh, the customer journey. And so somebody who's just thinking about losing weight, I call beginner Betty. They're not invested in that quite yet. They're maybe dabbling, their toe dipping in it. They aren't ready to buy. So there's this whole journey that they need to go on until they become the expert Esther or the person who knows I need to invest in somebody to help me. I know if I invest in somebody to help me, it's going to collapse time. I know that this is worth 
finding somebody to hire. And so you want to really focus your content around the problems expert Esther is having, because even though it's less people, because if you think of a funnel, right, beginner Betty is at the very top of the funnel. And as you get towards the bottom of the funnel, one, um, less views means higher converting views. And two, you have less competition on YouTube for more advanced content. Everybody can create a video on how to lose right weight. Like that is a massively competitive search term or keyword. Whereas you can focus on the very specific problems that your audience is having that you help them with as a coach, that's going to attract them from day one, from video number one. So that's how you want to look at your content. Um, I think, you know, for me, if I were to try to look for a coach, I currently have a health coach this year for the first time. And I was looking specifically not how to lose weight. That was my problem. But I know the basics of how to lose weight. I don't need that beginner stuff. I was trying to figure out what, first of all, somebody getting close to 40 needed to do. Is it cortisone levels? Like more advanced topics than just how to lose weight, how to work out, how to do, like those were not the topics I was looking at. So if those were the types of content you were creating. I wasn't going to be attracted to you in your channel and you weren't going to get me as a client because I'm past that. I'm looking for somebody who's talking specifically to me. Mm. And I love this so much because, and you mentioned, you know, your, you knew your problem. I like to call those the pain points of our soulmate clients. We have to know our soulmate clients so well that we know specifically what they're thinking, what they're searching for. And when I, I love this and I, I don't remember the exact statistic, maybe you know it, Trina, but when people go to social media platforms, they're just kind of gathering information. They're they're like your uh, beginner buddy. But mm -hmm. people who go to search engines for answers, Google, YouTube, even Pinterest, they're ready to get that solution. They know their pain point and they're ready to buy. Mm -hmm. And so we, from what you're saying, we need to create that content that's really going to address the pain point that the person who's ready to buy has recognized they have. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I like to think Instagram and TikTok, right? The vertical video is kind of entertainment. If we think about it, how we use it, interact with it, we go to reels and we're just scrolling to maybe kill time. We're not going to necessarily find information if we stumble upon something that's interesting. And the same thing with shorts over on YouTube. Shorts is not a tactic that I recommend most business owners use because shorts is very much like reels. It's an entertainment platform. And those aren't the people we necessarily want to attract. I would, I tell my clients, focus your time on your longer form videos because the ROI will pay off there instead of trying to even repurpose your reels. Like why even upload them, put the title in, do the extra stuff when you can just focus on creating really good long form content. And when I say long form, I mean anything more than a minute, which is which is shorts, right? Long form content could be five minutes. It could be 25 minutes, whatever your videos end up being. I love that because I was going to ask you what your time frame was because, you know, there's those statistics out there that, you know, we have to grab attention within the first three seconds or yes. people are going to go away because attention spans are so short now because of all the digital media. But they, also people don't stick around unless you're entertaining them or you're really interesting. And is mm -hmm. there a is there a specific time frame that you recommend? Do people drop off after seven minutes? Can we can we do 30 minutes? Mm -hmm. Like, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so what's really great about YouTube is the platform wants you to succeed because the better your content is, the more ads they can play on your videos and the more money they ultimately make from brands. So YouTube will literally show you your audience retention for your videos. So you can see exactly, is your hook keeping people watching? Do you say something? Every time you say something, people leave your video. You could get into that specific about how you're delivering your content because YouTube wants you to create good content. And so there's no right or wrong answer for how long your videos can be. Another thing to think about, uh, I like to use YouTube as a game of Mario Brothers where you go down the tube and you're trying to collect as many gold coins as possible. One of the ways to collect as many gold coins as possible and become valuable to YouTube so that YouTube promotes you is collecting as much watch time as possible. So if you think about, you know, a 15 minute video, if people watch 50% of that 15 minute video, that's if my math is right, like seven and a half minutes. 
Where if you create a five minute video and people only watch 50%, that's two and a half minutes. So you also want to weigh, how am I going to get watch time on my channel as well? Not to say we're going to create a 15 minute video, add fluff just to make 15 minute videos, but how can we create valuable content? And I never even know how long my videos are going to be when I create them. I know what my title is going to be, the promise that I'm providing in that title. And I just have to make sure I deliver on that promise of that title. It could be five minutes. It could be 11 minutes. It could be I've done 30, 35 minute videos, but I want to deliver on that promise that is in the title and the reason they clicked on that video. Mm, I love that so much. So let's talk about how often we should post. Mm -hmm. You're going to love it, but I say once a week. Honestly, wow. once a week is enough because, again, we're not trying to be YouTubers. We're trying to create content that attracts our ready-to-buy audience. And we just had a case study of a client with his first video of our strategy. He had been posting his podcast on YouTube for over a year, and his channel just was like plateaued. Uh, and it didn't, it didn't really have much of an audience. He was just kind of a dumping ground for his podcast. Within our first video of our strategic video we helped him develop, he got a lead like a solid lead. Somebody found that video, applied to work with him. And then I don't have the exact numbers, but within a year, he had, I, I want to say like 3,000 views on his channel. Within the first month of us, he had 6,500 views just in one month. And that was one video a week. And so what I like to call this is compounding views. It's almost like a compounding interest chart. But when you publish a YouTube video, when you use the right strategy, you're also encouraging them to watch your past videos too. So mm -hmm. you'll publish a video, you'll get those initial views on a new video, YouTube uh, favors new content too, so it'll promote your content a little bit. But if you do it right, that viewer that finds that new video will go back and watch an older video and an older video, and they'll go down this binge watch session. And so while the initial video gets views, you're compounding more views on the older videos as well. And that's how you can really start to build that authority, not only on YouTube, but with your audience as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's so valuable. And I know there are things like the, um, let's see, the end notes and the cards, and there's all these little things that you can actually set up in your, the back end. So that, and then you can create a strategy like, oh, I'm talking about um, holistic nutrition practices or something like that. And then you could actually take that video that you're linking today or talking about today, and then you can actually suggest which video they should go to that's going to give them more information on that. And I, I love your example of your client because that historically has been us. Like we've put master classes up, but mostly we've just put the podcast there. And uh, there's a, we have a lot of opportunity that we're missing, but we're changing that <laughs> um, slowly, but surely. Um, okay. So let's talk about the, because YouTube is a search engine and it's right up there with power to Google, like in terms of people going there to search for answers. So let's talk about SEO. And I, from what I understand, your title and your description are very important for your SEO, for people to find you. Is that right? Is that like, where do we need to put our efforts in terms of the keywords and key phrases? So this is one of the biggest misconceptions that YouTube SEO works the same way as Google SEO. You want to think about your creating videos for humans. So if you're plugging in this lame, boring search engine optimized title, who's going to click on it? Because if they're looking at your video compared to all the other options, they're going to click on the most FOMO enticing, most interesting, most curio curiosity building title. So if you're just posting in there, how to lower your cortisone weight or how to lower your cortisone levels. If somebody else is on there talking about, you know, the five quick ways that I lost weight by lowering my cortisone levels. Like I'm just throwing things out there, but that mm -hmm. sounds a lot more enticing than just this boring search engine optimized title. Because mm -hmm. when you upload your video to YouTube, it already knows what you're talking about. So the SEO strategy starts in the content planning piece. And that's kind of where it stays. Because when you move forward with your content, you've got to make sure your title and your thumbnail are going to get humans to click. 
Because if humans aren't clicking on your videos, your content's gonna get buried by YouTube. It's not gonna put your videos in prime real estate, like the homepage or search or suggested if people aren't clicking on it. So if your titles are boring, if your thumbnails are boring because you're trying to worry about SEO optimized titles, your content's not gonna be found. What's more valuable for YouTube, like I said, is click-through rates. So if YouTube puts your videos in front of people, will they actually click? And audience retention. So are you getting people to actually watch your videos? Because if you're losing people, you're losing like 80% of people in the first 30 seconds. Again, YouTube's gonna bury that content because YouTube values quality experience on the platform. And if people are clicking on your video and realizing this isn't interesting and they leave, that's not a positive experience for that viewer. So YouTube is not going to put that video in front of more people because that viewer is not having a positive experience with that content. So SEO plays a role in the beginning as you build your strategy, but then it just kind of hangs there because you need to think about how you're going to create a great experience for that viewer on the platform. Yeah, it's, it's almost more of a hook than it is um, an SEO title per se. Yeah. Yeah. Headline. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, okay. I think we have talked about all of the questions. Oh no, I do have one more question for you. So when we're creating these videos for YouTube, mm -hmm. it, it's so different than a reel unless you're doing the shorts, but for the types of videos we're speaking of today, obviously you need to be well lit, minimize distractions in the background, uh, be on brand so that, you know, whatever your background is, whatever your clothes are, whatever, like be on brand and represent yourself as your personal brand, as who, as who you are. But do you have other video creation tips for YouTube? Like, are they looking for specific things in terms of quality, um, things like that? I think a lot of the time people overthink their video content. Um, I know people, when they say be on brand, I know people who are on brand that wear specific clothes that go with their brand. I don't go that extensive. I, I grab no, what's that's in, too yeah. much. Yeah. yeah. And I we grab... actually, we just aired an episode on this, how you don't have to wear your brand colors all the time. Like, yeah. but wear what represents you yeah. as yeah. a brand. Like yeah, if yeah, you're, yeah. you know, if you're, if your brand is goth, go goth. If your yeah. brand is not goth, definitely don't go goth. <laughs> Yeah. And I, what I've been realizing, cause we've been testing some things. I always test things on my channel, more raw kind of organic content is doing really well. Um, so if you look at trends on TikTok right now, the longer form TikToks where people are just talking real raw to the camera are doing really well. And we've noticed that on YouTube too. I started a series, I believe in March where it's very minimal effort for me. I just sit here. I, I'm at a little bit different of an angle to signal like this is a different series. It's not, not me talking straight on. I, I'm angled a little bit. And it is just me kind of having a conversation, a strategic conversation on a specific topic. And I keep the editing very minimal. These are videos that I edit. I don't add anything super fancy to the editing. And these videos have been crushing it on my channel right now because it feels real. It doesn't feel overdone. It doesn't feel overproduced and people want connection right now. They're just starving for connection, feeling like they're not alone. And these types of videos make them feel like they're sitting in this room talking to you, make them feel like you know what they're struggling with right now. And so when you get started on YouTube, there doesn't need to be this extensive production process because of the audience retention graph that you have, you can start creating videos and see how it performs. Like I said, I wasn't sure how these minimal videos were going to perform, but they are crushing my audience retention graphs. They are some of the highest watched videos that I've had in the recent years. And again, I'm not doing a lot into it, but when it comes to quality, you could use your cell phone. I've shot multiple videos in a pinch from my cell phone, from like my iPhone. I like minimal setup. If I overcomplicate it, I'm not going to do it. So I just have a point and shoot camera. My favorite is the Sony ZV-1. It has a microphone that is attached to it. And that is it. I have a ring light on myself as well. And that's as extensive as my setup is going to be. You could also, I have a window here to my left. I could just turn my um, camera to the left and that would be good enough light. I wouldn't even need a ring light because that's good enough light as well. So I think it's, you know, find something, a minimal viable production process with decent uh, camera, like um, sometimes webcams, 
don't always have the best quality. Also, if you're recording a webcam through like a Zoom, that's not going to give you the best quality because you're recording through the internet and the the tech, whatever it is, the broadband will affect the quality of it. So you want to focus on filming on an actual camera or an actual phone, or maybe I think it's screen time maybe on a um, computer, but not filming through something like Zoom or um, other those streaming apps. So yeah, don't overthink it. Just get content up first and see how your audience retention graph looks. Okay. Yeah. Great tips. Super great tips. All right. So Trina, let's go back to what you mentioned in the beginning. And you, you mentioned that you had postpartum depression and um, YouTube helped you navigate that. So we're not going to talk about that per se, but I would love to, to have you touch on how your clients with anxiety or depression, how, how you use YouTube differently than what social media would be as part of a business strategy for people who do have mental health struggles. Yeah. Posting content on Instagram. I don't feel so much on TikTok. I feel TikTok's a little bit different, but posting content on Instagram, obviously you are on Instagram and I feel like it is a, uh, like what the Joneses are doing or whatever that, you know, reference is keeping up with the Joneses on mm -hmm. Instagram. And I find myself, whenever I'm posting content or trying to be consistent on Instagram, I'm also comparing myself to everyone else on Instagram. And it makes me feel less. It makes me feel like I'm not doing enough. And then I get into a cycle of trying to do more like they are doing. And I don't really know what's going on behind the scenes with them. I think this became a realization to me when I got in a mastermind. And I went to the first in-person one right after COVID. And I heard business owners speaking truly, like not the Instagram version of themselves. And they were all struggling with the same things as I was. But on Instagram, it looks like they're crushing it. They're killing it. They're having the best life ever. And then it made me feel like I was doing something wrong. But in reality, they aren't. And so for me to be on Instagram, I, I even just experienced it this year. I at the beginning of the year, I had this whole plan for social on Instagram and I got on Instagram and it just I froze. I felt like I didn't have the best strategy. I didn't know what the best ideas were. My reels weren't going to be edited right. And then I had to actually stop following some people as well, because as soon as I saw them talking about something, that was a trigger to me. And so what I love about YouTube is it's kind of curated on YouTube, because if you're watching content on YouTube, that's the kind of content that you're going to get. So there are like five or six channels that I watch quite frequently on my business YouTube channel. And then our family has a channel that we watch certain um, content on that the kids like, and there are channels that we watch on there. But I'm not constantly inundated with the next big idea or the next big strategy or the next big thing that I need to do right now because this is working so well for you. Uh, and so that's why I enjoy YouTube because it's kind of a blinders factor. I can focus on my content in the people's content that I really like and not have all this loud shouting at me over on Instagram. Mm -hmm. I love it so much. And that's so important to recognize. If you don't feel good, you don't have to be on these platforms mm -hmm. and you know, I, I went off of social media completely for Lent. So I was off for a good six weeks and I've barely been back on because every time I go back on all these things are coming up in my profile and these are not things that I'm interested in. They don't align with my values. They're just not anything. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them just make me feel pensive. Um, a little Makes bit me anxious. Feel less. Like, oh, exactly. I'm not doing that. And doubtful. I, I'm failing. And Exactly. And I'm like, it's to me, it's just not worth it because there are so many other strategies that we can use to grow our businesses. And so for me, it's all about success without social media. And I love that um, you have created an environment and strategies that are helping people do the same thing. So thank you for the work you're doing. And thank you for sharing your story and your input and perspective on social media versus YouTube as well. So Trina, I do love... Oh, sorry. Okay, I do sorry. love Instagram, but for me to show up on Instagram, I have a daughter as well. I make an effort to show up real. So I won't put a filter on, even though I have rosacea and like, I'm not looking the best, but 
Uh, I'm constantly thinking how I felt as a business owner. So I try to show up real. I try to talk about actual topics that I'm struggling with. And I try to show up as me too, so that my nine-year-old doesn't think, oh, I always need to have a filter. This is how things look. And so I think there's still a great place for us to show up on Instagram, mm -hmm. to show up to be who we want to be and for other people to see it. Um, the other thing I think happens on Instagram is we start to see other strategies and think we need to do that. And so the game plan that we had in place, squirrel syndrome happens. And then we just keep getting in this cycle of doing more and more and more and burning out. And so I did just mm -hmm. want to touch on those things. Like there's a good place for it to show up and be a positive light on Instagram, but to also be aware of those squirrel syndrome moments so that mm -hmm. you're not abandoning ship on the strategy that you planned out for three months because somebody else said, oh, this is actually working now. Yeah. And it's absolutely critical that we discern. And mm -hmm. I think I like to go on and consume from the people that I follow. Mm -hmm. But like you said, it's eliminating those that cause me to feel less than it's eliminating the things that create doubt or fear or take me down that road to comparison, which ultimately then leads to, oh, I better do that strategy because they look mm -hmm. successful. And so they if they're doing it, I better do it. And it does result in burnout. And that's why if you're a person who struggles to discern, or every time you go on, you have that squirrel syndrome yeah. and you kind of squash your confidence in the strategy you've already implemented, it's not healthy. And so you really have to discern what you're going to do to either alleviate that problem or eliminate the problem. So Super great advice. All right, Trina, where can the listeners connect with you, learn more from you, maybe even yeah. hire you? Yeah, uh, so obviously YouTube, trinalittle.com forward slash YouTube, lots of stuff there. Like I said, I do like to show up on Instagram. I'm working on showing up more as me. Um, I feel like I'm having this new renaissance or this new era. Um, I'm a Taylor Swift fan. So I feel like there's this new era of me coming out that I want to just show up on Instagram more as me and talk about my values. Uh, and I do have a workshop, Profit Preview, where I share basically the beginnings of how to build your YouTube strategy. So how to find those content ideas that you're ready to buy viewer is looking for, and also how to start building your YouTube funnel as well with those content ideas. And that's at trinalittle.com forward slash PPV. And I will have all those links in the show notes. So listeners, thank you so much for being here today. I truly appreciate each and every one of you. And I wish you much luck in adopting a YouTube strategy. If you have questions, don't hesitate to reach out to Trina or shoot me an email and I will be happy to answer any questions that I can as well. All right, with that, we will see you all next time.